Doug Peterson speaks today. The locker room opens for about 40 or 45 minutes for us to find out what their thoughts are on the Redskins. And to do that, we turn it over to our 97.3 ESPN Eagles insider, John McMullen. John, game week is officially here. Yeah, pretty exciting, finally. More so for the fact that what's in the rearview mirror, we can finally put the preseason behind us and look at the Washington Redskins in week one and everybody's panicking about that intelligence gathering. You know, D.C.'s famous for uh, intelligence work. So the Redskins are bringing in Wendell Smallwood and Trevon Hester. Yes, Trayvon Hester gets signed as well. Uh, he, uh, the fingertip, uh, he famous for the fingertip of the quadruple doink there on the Cody Parker play against the Bears. But, uh, John, you don't really buy into any of that, do you? I mean, when these guys, like, I actually retweeted that this morning, either your tweet or a tweet about it, and said, like, it always cracks me up when other teams bring people in, like they're going to get some state secrets or something, like find out, you know, uh, <laughs> who kidnapped the Lindbergh baby or something like that. You know what I mean? They're going to get some amazing yeah. revelation, which really doesn't happen. No, it's silly. <laughs> That's right. uh, the Redskins play the Eagles twice every year. Uh, and, you know, sometimes when you have new coaching staff, new philosophies, you don't quite know uh, what the other team is about. But uh, you have two veteran coaching staff, two veteran head coaches who been in their respective spots for a while now so they understand what each side wants to accomplish they've seen them uh twice a year and from the redskins perspective it's more that they don't have a lot of talent right now uh and they're trying to get better players and they're bringing in players they think might be better than what they had so it's not really about intelligence gathering and, and, and things like that. And, and But people love it. People love that kind of story. And of course, we also love trying to uh, DD, like decipher Doug, right? I mean, th that is basically one of the jobs that you have on the beat is to not only ask the pointed questions to get the right response, but also to try and read between the lines. Doug speaks today. I guess we'll start on the defensive side of things, John, because, uh, you know, are these guys getting healthy? Are they actually going to play? You know, what did you learn today from Doug's comments? Well, he claims er everyone is kind of online to potentially play, leaving the caveat open that no decisions have been made, which is understandable. Now that you're in actual uh, regular season mode, you do have uh, a competitive advantage uh, aspect to it, so you do get that part of it. But that's been the, the thought process from the organization throughout the summer, really, is that all these rehab guys, you think about especially defensively, uh, Fletcher Cox and Derek Barnett up front, uh, Nigel Bradham at linebacker, Ronald Dar Darby at corner, all these players uh, have done not much practicing. Uh, it's a mixed bag. Derek Barnett and Darby have been back in team drills. and uh, Nigel's done seven on seven. Fletcher hasn't done anything uh, in practice. So uh, it's been one of those things where they were trying to get everybody ready for week one. Uh, everybody's ramping up for this. And I think the bigger question is how, how sharp are they? Because I think certainly the majority of them, Fletcher's going to play. He told us that two weeks ago. He needed one week of preparation, and that's it, and he's going to be out there. Uh, but is he going to be 100%? That I don't know. Ronald Darby uh, is going to be out there. Uh, Doug confirmed the starting corners, which we told you that would be since basically the spring. Uh, and that's going to be Darby, Sidney Jones on the outside, Avante Maddox in the slot. Uh, but is Darby going to be hold, ha, able to hold up for every single play? Probably not. Same thing with Derek Barnett, uh, but you have a rotational system on the defensive line. The one guy I would question, because it came out of his mouth, is Nigel Bradham, because he said he's not sure if he's going to be ready for week one. Offensively, I find it very hard to believe Brandon Brooks is going to be out there, but we'll see. 
John McMullen with us at the Novacare Complex today for Eagles game week preparation against the Redskins. Yeah, you talk about Barnett, too, and, and I know you wrote on our website, 973ESPN.com, you know, because of the Jadavian Clowney sweepstakes, Barnett's going to obviously be under the microscope now. Yeah, it's probably not fair, uh, but that's the reason the Eagles didn't get involved. And, and Howie Roseman, when cut down to 53 kind of explained that that it, it might not be the narrative outside the building but inside the building the Eagles like their defensive end a lot and they weren't looking uh, to add to that group and you know Brandon Graham's a proven guy so you start thinking about what the Eagles did to clear a path for Derek Barnett and that trade Michael Bennett that essentially let Chris Long retire and there's going to be a, a pretty big microscope on him and if he doesn't produce you're going to hear that crop back up especially when you look at what Seattle gave Houston to get Clowney which wasn't much there's going to be a lot of upset people if Derek Barnett doesn't perform even though it really has nothing to do with Derek Barnett, which is the decision the Eagles made. Right, and Clowney was interested in coming to Philadelphia, were the reports, correct? Yes, he he wanted to come to a contender, uh, and the two teams floated were Seattle, and from his camp were Seattle and the Eagles. But as we all know, or we all should know by now, Every agent in this industry floats the Eagles out there because of Howie's reputation. Uh, so sometimes it's real, sometimes it isn't real. In this case, it wasn't real. Uh, it was a one-way street. The Eagles didn't have much interest at all. So, John, I know there's also some, uh, in your Monday minutia, uh, the extension to Craven LeBlanc. Uh, did that catch you by surprise? I mean, especially, you know, he's dealing with a sprained foot. He, he may not be on people's minds, and yet the Eagles went and scooped him up and signed him to a one-year extension. Yeah, it just tells you they like him. He's not going to be ready for a, a few weeks, and it'll be interesting. We'll see. I, I think there's still some moves to be made uh, by uh, Sunday. Uh, maybe even by Wednesday when when the first really full-scale practice of the week is. There might be some changes on the roster. Pravon was always a guy that was a, a possibility to be placed on injured reserve with a designation to return uh, because he's going to be out for a while but not out uh, for the entire season. Uh, but the extension just tells you they like him as a player. Uh, he, he is on a contract year was on a contract year so they get him uh and we'll see what the numbers turn out to be generally with the eagles tends to be very team friendly uh and now they have him under contract through 2020 so it's just more of an indication that he's a player they like uh and understandably so because he came in late last year and he he performed very well and I know you caught up with another player on the defensive side of the football at a position linebacker that you always say is pretty critical to the Eagles' success, or you think it's going to be critical to their success. Uh, tell us what Kamu Gruger hill had to say about uh, his uh, recovery from a sprained MCL. Yeah, he's another guy that's not going to be ready week one, and that wasn't unexpected But the Eagles because he's He's one of their two starting linebackers, along with Nigel Bradham, when everybody's healthy. Uh, so it's a more significant uh, issue than people probably realize. He was having a great camp before he went down. Uh, it's going to be a multiple-week injury, uh, but Camus said he's progressing well. If anything, it's gone quicker than expected. So maybe a, a three- or four-week injury is turning into a two- or three-week injury. Uh, but he should be back relatively early in the regular season, and that's pretty big because uh, he's one of the best coverage linebackers the Eagles have, and that's really what the uh, the more important role of the modern linebacker has become in the NFL. John, I want to switch over, you know, to some offensive stuff with you, and I guess a good place to start is the quarterback, uh, Carson Wentz. <laughs> What uh, what can we expect from you know this week of practice and 
game plan for the offense, for, you know, heading into Sunday? What's how much time are the running backs going to get? What's Carson's outlook and game plan and, you know, everything leading up to, to week one Redskins for the offense? Uh, I thought you were going to talk about Kyle Lawletto when you said the quarterback. <laughs> I, I almost did. We'll get there. <laughs> I mean, it, it is going to be interesting to see what the Eagles game plan is week one simply because they've added uh, so much from a playmaker standpoint. Last year, Doug was pretty clear with us, especially off the record in situations and explaining his game plan. Uh, and and what it basically came down to is that it ran through Zach Ertz first and then all Sean Jeffrey after that. Now you have so much more talent. You put Deshaun Jackson back in the mix. Uh, Dallas Goddard uh, has really improved and the Eagles think he's a really good player so you talk about 11 versus 12 personnel two tight ends versus three receivers you still have Nelson Aguilar and then you've 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 upped the talent in the running back room with Jordan Howard and Miles Sanders uh, and then you have Darren Sproles which Doug confirmed again that he will be the punt returner today and and the third down back so anybody thinking that was going to go in a different direction. It's not going to happen at least early in the season. But I, I think the biggest issue from Doug Peterson's standpoint and by extension Carson Wentz is keeping everybody happy. How do you keep everybody happy? And I, I think that might be one of the biggest problems the Eagles have. I really do. It's a good problem to have, but a, a good problem is still a problem at times. And you look at Sean Jackson, everyone's talked about his maturity. You look at his history, if he doesn't get the ball a lot, in the past you've seen some chirping. In the past you've seen some uh, chirping from anonymous sources about Carson Wentz leaning on Zach Ertz. Is that going to crop up at some point this season? I bet you it does at some point. So how do you keep all these guys healthy, uh, not healthy, how do you keep them all happy? And I don't really have an answer to that question. There's only one football. You bring up Deshaun Jackson. Is he practicing this weekend or this week? <laughs> yeah, well, I, Wednesday's a big day. I mean, they just went through a little bit of a walk through a light session today. Uh, yeah, and all indications are it's not a serious injury. Uh, broken left ring finger, uh, and he is expected to play week one. Uh, they might hold him back a day, but he is expected to play. Uh, you know, another another person that I want to bring up here, Jason Peters, who you've you've already touched on. What can we expect from him? You know, game one, week one. Is he playing fifty percent, sixty percent, and then what's the rotation looking like? Oh, no, he's playing 100%. Now, that's the goal. That's the goal every week. That was the goal last year. He's the left. Well, I know it's the goal, but are we, are we, should we expect that? <laughs> well, I think it, it's more likely to happen this year than last year. Jason uh, explained, you know, people forget he was coming off a torn ACL, uh, and it was very similar to Carson Wentz. And he, if people talk about, all the time and doctors say you're not you don't feel like yourself until that second year and Jason's now in that category as well so he feels much healthier as a whole um, and while he didn't say it uh, it, it stated you, you could at least intimate the fact that maybe some of the issues were caused uh, because he didn't have full confidence in the knee and he was perhaps uh, relying on other uh, parts of his body to make up for a knee that wasn't quite feeling 100%, and that sort of chipped into the injury situation. Uh, so he feels much better. He's 100% going into week one. Um, I expect him to play every play at left tackle. Uh, but the good news is if he doesn't, <laughs> your first-round pick is ready to step in. So, I mean, that's impressive depth. Anybody who's been paying attention to NFL roster cuts all across the league, you saw all those trades with bad offensive linemen. There's a lot of teams in this league 
with bad offensive linemen looking to upgrade. So the Eagles uh, really have uh, a deep offensive line and arguably the best offensive line in the entire NFL. Like you said, John, you know, in the article, Doug, Doug said it. He's on record. Deepest roster he's had in Philadelphia since he's been here. And I want to... Yeah, but he didn't say dream team, thank God. No, no. Well, th- those words are banned now in that locker room. You can't say that. Um, it, John, I want to switch to the running back position, and you touched on it a few minutes earlier. Uh, Jordan Howard, PT and I talked about this a little bit earlier in the show, and I feel like he's not getting a, a lot of discussion or, or focus. Maybe I'm, I'm off on that assessment. But you know, I feel like that once we get into week four, week five, week six, that this we could see Miles Sanders getting more and more reps and Jordan Howard taking a back seat with Sproles in the mix as well. How do you assess you know, or predict Howard's role in the running back room? Uh, he's a starting running back week one, and, and I think Miles Sanders has an opportunity to earn more playing time as we go along, but I think it might head the opposite direction. Uh, I think people are going to be surprised uh, by Jordan Howard. I think he's the best lead back Doug has had uh, since he's been here, and he's had a different one each year. Uh, and for whatever reason, I mean, you don't play the starters in the preseason all that much. He, he played a little bit more than most. Uh, you're not going to stand out on that platform. Uh, everybody wants Shady McCoy. They want Melvin Gordon. Uh, I don't get it. I, I mean, the Eagles uh, feel good about the running back position. Uh, they feel good that, as I mentioned, the talent upgrade is pretty significant. And it starts with Jordan Howard. It doesn't start with Miles Sanders. Miles Sanders is a rookie. In a lot of ways, I think it's unfair uh, what people are expecting out of him, uh, especially early, uh, because there is a ramp-up period. And it's got to do with more of the little things, picking up blitzes, running the right routes, understanding your role. Uh, You know, it's not just running the football. Uh, So from that standpoint, uh, I think as Doug tends to do with Darren Sproles, and I always say he defaults to him. Well, he's going to continue to default to Darren Sproles in key situations. Uh, but if he's not, it's going to be because of Jordan Howard, not Miles Sanders. Hey, John, now, you know, when uh, Ryan said quarterback, right, you know, he, he, he went with Carson Wentz, but uh, there is a quarterback name that's now in the room that people weren't ag- expecting to be or at least on the squad that people weren't expecting to be around can you tell us about him yeah well i think the biggest surprise today was that doug admitted that the eagles wanted clayton thorson back uh to put on the practice squad which was i think surprised us all uh from the way he performed not only in the preseason games but also in in practice so clayton decided to sign with the dallas cowboys practice squad which means by the way he chose the cowboys over the eagles so he will become a villain in philadelphia fans minds but uh from that standpoint the eagles wanted a developmental quarterback in here uh and decided to bring in kyle lawletta who is an extant native and grew up an Eagles fan. So from that standpoint, the fans will be happy. But, <laughs> you know, when you have four quarterbacks, eh, there's not a lot, not a, enough work to go along. So it won't be an issue for a couple of weeks because Nate Sutfeld's not ready to practice. Uh, but generally in, in the regular season, the first team quarterback gets 80 or 85% of the reps. The second team gets the, the other reps and the third team quarterback runs uh, the scout team. So I'm not sure why the Eagles want a fourth quarterback other than Josh McCown is 40 and he's not here long term. And they want a developmental guy in the room. So you kind of take a swing at it, and just like Thorson. And who knows, maybe you hit a home run. Uh, but a lot of teams do this. They just kind of regurgitate backup quarterbacks and hope one develops. 
John McGlone's with us, our 97.3 ESPN Eagles insider. Doug Peterson speaking today at the Novacare Complex. Locker room open as well. Tomorrow, a day off for everyone, Ryan. So we all have to work a little harder to come up with storylines on a quiet day. But quiet was the word you used in your article over the weekend where you said the Eagles stay quiet on the waiver wire, John. You can read that on 973ESPN.com. And that offensive tackle, you know, uh, that was supposed to be the, uh, the the makeup, the make good for Alejandro Villanueva getting away. This was going to be Jeff Stoutland's project to make it work with Brett in Arizona, came in and plucked him. Yeah, that was a little bit of a surprise. I know the Eagles thought they could get uh, Toss or Tooth, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, uh, back to the practice squad. A, because he, he hasn't, you know, before the, the U.S. government changed the, the waiver procedure for service academies, he, he had to have that two-year service commitment. Uh, so he was in the middle of that. Uh, and wasn't obviously working out for football, so he acknowledged when he got here he was about 290, he wanted to get up to 315, uh, and he's not ready to play at this point. So Eagles considered him a, a long-term project with a lot of upside, uh, and first thing he needed to get in an NFL weight room and gain the weight back, and he said he wanted to get up to 315 pounds, but I talked about teams and how badly they needed offensive linemen, well, this is a perfect example. I mean, Arizona is willing to give him a roster spot and carry him, even though he acknowledged himself he's not ready to play, uh, just because they're that bad and that desperate for offensive line. So, kind of one, you just got to say, oh, well, what can you do and uh, try to find somebody else. And you also have a great article up about uh, Ward versus Mac Collins, too. In fact, invoking that in 2015, Chip Kelly full out said, hey, Najee Good, number 54, on a day where we only take 53. Uh, Howie Roseman didn't fully admit that, but you think it's pretty clear that that's what's going on there in the in the camp battle, Ward versus Collins, that ultimately went in the other direction. Yeah, and the Eagles were able to get Greg back on the practice squad, so that helps a little bit. But it, it's kind of, and how he explained it uh, very well, to his credit, if you're going to be the fifth receiver, hey, Greg flat out outplayed Matt Collins as a receiver uh, in camp. You, whether you want to talk about the injuries or uh, put every caveat on that you want, he was better as a receiver. Uh, but if you're the fifth receiver on the team, and this is where Howie is correct, you're not going to play receiver. You're not going to, uh, unless there is significant injuries to multiple bodies at the position, what you're going to do is help on special teams. And that's where Mac had the advantage. Although, I, I will say, you know, Mac was a heck of a special teams player in college at North Carolina. When he was healthy here, that really never took off or you never really saw that not that he was bad but he wasn't exactly one of the Eagles best special teams players so part of it is the fact that he was a draft pick versus the undrafted part uh, but most of it had to do with special teams and they think Mac has an opportunity to better be a better special teams player than Greg Ward all right before we let you go John McBowen 97.3 ESPN Eagles insider takes great pride in assessing who he thinks the 53 are going to be. Did I read ah. the tea leaves right that you you were in a four-way tie? You had 51. Who who were the people you were tied with? What did it come down to? I, we, we need to know how this all broke down. Uh, Bo Wolf, uh, one of the athletics. Uh, ah, and Bo. Zach Rosenblatt from NJ.com. Uh, was also tied for the league, and, and Jimmy Kemsky, our friend from Philly Voice. Uh, we all got 51. Uh, the Eagles screwed us all with tight ends. We all thought they were going to go heavy at tight end. They only kept two, so I only got two wrong. Uh, Richard Rogers, who they put on injured reserve. Josh Perkins, who they cut and brought back to the practice squad. Uh, and then it goes to the tiebreaker, which was the practice squad. And Bo beat me by one. And the worst part is, 
at the Jets, suffering through the Jets-Eagles preseason finale, down in the locker room, talking to Alex Singleton, who played phenomenally. Yes. I had him on my practice squad. He gave the impression that he did not want to be on a practice squad. He would go back to Canada. So I took him off. Oh, and Alex he signed you. on the practice squad. He tricked you. Ah, he tricked me. Come on, and Alex. And Alex is the nicest guy, maybe, in the Eagles locker room. And he screwed me. <laughs> <laughs> you could have been the winner. Have you won before? Yeah, I won two years ago. Uh, and I came I tied for first last year, tied for first this year, and lost in the tiebreaker. Well, well, what could be a dynasty <laughs> is now I'm looking for a new coach, as I put on Twitter. You're, you're always first place in our book, Johnny Mack. Uh, we appreciate you every day here. Football at four, and I certainly appreciate you when you join me Saturdays on the Pete Thompson Show as well. Thank you, my friend. Uh, we will talk to you again tomorrow at this time. All right, thanks, guys.